Bipolar is a disease surrounded by a lot of really interesting and important history, not only in terms of the impact of the pathogen itself and the amount of mortality that it's caused, but also for the work done by the father of epidemiology, um, John Snow. So in the 1870s, there was an outbreak of cholera in London. And what John Snow did is he plotted all of the cases of cholera. So this is a map of the Soho region of London. And you can see at each address on this map, he's put these sort of stacked histograms with each bar representing a single case. And what he was able to do was show that the distribution of cases was really associated with proximity to this particular pump, the Broad Street pump, um, and that people who got their water from this particular location were much more likely to have cholera than people from other parts of the city or who got their water from other parts of the city. A few years ago, I had a chance to visit uh, London, and there's a replica of the pump put up. And what was really interesting about this story is that Jon Snow removed the handle of the pump, preventing people from getting water from this source. And with that prevention of, of contact, the outbreak actually subsided. And so in this monument here, there's no, no handle on the pump. If we look at his data at a bit of a higher level, um, there were two primary water companies, um, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company and the Lambeth Water Company. Um, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company supplied the Broad Street pump. And what he saw was that of the uh, cholera deaths during this outbreak, uh, 1,263 of them were associated with people who got their water from this source. While those who got their water from the Lambeth Water Company were much less likely to have cholera. And so he was able to propose what at the time was a really revolutionary idea that disease was actually waterborne. Back in the 1870s, we didn't have a good understanding of germ theory. And so people had all sorts of really peculiar ideas about where this disease was coming from. From an epidemiological perspective, what Jon Snow was able to demonstrate is that if you can control access to the source, you can arrest a disease outbreak. I've put a link above to a video where Jon Snow's data is plotted out in sort of real time. So you can see how the outbreak progressed and how he was able to use this data to come to the conclusions he came to. So while there is some really interesting history around cholera, it is not an, an entirely historical disease. It does still cause problems in many parts of the world. Um, it's a disease where we do have vaccines available. There's an, a number of oral vaccine products um, that have been used. And it's a disease that if you're interested in learning more about it, because it plays such an important role in public health and is a disease of primarily low and middle income countries, there's some fantastic resources through the World Health Organization. And they actually offer uh, a, an open access course that you can access through this link here um, where you can learn more about cholera. Vibrio species also cause disease in um, animals other than people. So this is just some data that I've summarized out of a paper looking at organisms isolated from septic manatees, so Antillian manatees. And what they present in this paper are the blood culture results from 37 manatees. Out of these 37 animals, 18 of them were culture positive. And you can see the bacterial species that were isolated um, uh, over this population. So Aramonas, Again, think of this really commonly uh, in water from three animals. Uh, we also had Pseudomonas, so one of our lactose non-fermenters that we know are quite commonly identified in aquatic and marine environments. And then very interestingly, uh, Vibrio fluvialis. This was actually the single most commonly identified bacterial species in this population. So cholera might be a disease of people, but other Vibrio species cause important diseases in both domestic and wild animals. Vibrio anguillarum causes hemorrhagic septicemic disease, sort of colloquially known as vibriosis. And this is a big problem in aquaculture industries, whether it's fin fish, crustaceans, so shrimp, or bivalve, uh, bivalve aquaculture. Clinical signs include weight loss, lethargy, red spots, so red spots indicating uh, petechiation and ecchymotic hemorrhaging that we associate with sepsis. And we can also have ophthalmic involvement. So in finfish, we can see 
uh, corneal edema, opacity of the eye, uh, followed by ulceration, and eventually exophthalmia, so the eyes can pop out of the head. Vibrio harvier is a really interesting species. Um, this is an important pathogen of many, many uh, marine species, both fish and crustaceans. From an aquaculture perspective, shrimp are probably the most important. And one thing that's really cool about Vibrio harvier is that it's a luminescent bacteria. So in this image here, A and B, we have a culture plate with Vibrio harvier here under normal light. And then in the dark, uh, we get these organisms glowing. So very, very cool. This organism can actually cause luminous vibriosis in painted shrimp. So you know the shrimp are sick because they're glowing. Um, these pictures are from this paper here, if you're interested in learning more. And I've also got a really interesting table here, which summarizes some of the common manifestations of Vibrio harvier infections. So in our fin fish species, we see eye infections, gastroenteritis, nodules on their operculum, skin ulcers, tail rot, and vasculitis. Pretty broad array of diseases. And then in our invertebrates, we can see acute septicemic disease. Um, we can see luminous vibriosis, as I said, in our painted shrimp, and then infections in some of our more exotic animals as well, including sea cucumbers, seahorse, um, and Japanese abalone. In an aquaculture setting, treatment is really, really difficult. Antimicrobials have been attempted to varying degrees of success. Some researchers have looked at bacteriophages, uh, biological control agents, which are essentially probiotics or dietary supplements. Um, so aquaculture has a lot of really interesting um, challenges, and there's many unique features of working in this setting um, that really differentiates it from other areas of practice in veterinary medicine. Not all Vibrio species actually cause disease. And one sort of brief example that I just wanted to highlight because it's so cool is Vibrio fisheri. Um, this is a species which colonizes the light organ of bobtailed uh, squid, so this little guy here. What's really interesting about these animals is that when Vibrio fisheri colonizes their light organ, it allows them to glow at night, which maybe a little bit paradoxically is a really important uh, strategy for camouflage. As these squid swim near the surface of the water, Predators from below can't differentiate their glowing body from starlight, and so it actually protects them. If you find this as interesting as I do, um, check out this talk by Dr. Bonnie Bassler, um, who gives a TED Talk where she talks about a number of different things, including uh, Vibrio fissuri and how they communicate with each other. Vibrio vulnificus is a cause of really serious infections in people. Um, it will infect wounds, it can cause a primary septicemia, and gastroenteritis as well. It's contracted not only by ingestion, but also contact with water where the organism is present. So going into um, the ocean when you have cuts or, or lesions on your skin can allow the organism to get in and has been associated with really life-threatening infections. People who are most at risk of developing these serious conditions um, typically have some sort of pre-existing health problem, so particularly liver disease. Interestingly, Vibrio vulnificus is not only a problem for people, but it's also been reported to be pathogenic for eels. In the next couple of slides, I'm going to show some of the lesions associated with Vibrio vulnificus, and they're somewhat graphic images. Here we can see these very severe lesions on this patient's foot. Um, we have a lot of ulceration, reddening, it's hemorrhagic, uh, we actually have necrosis going on, so dying of the tissue. Very, very, very serious. This was a patient who went into the Baltic Sea in Germany um, and ended up getting necrotizing fasciitis, so bacteria um, moving between those fascial planes of the muscles and causing a, a rapidly progressive um, and rapidly life-threatening infection uh, with Vibrio vulnificus. So this was the patient sort of Soon after presentation, um, the tissue was debrided quite aggressively, so you can see many layers of the muscle had to be removed. Um, these infections need to be treated incredibly aggressively. Um, fortunately, this, per this person did live, um, and 
uh, required skin grafts in order to reconstruct the lower leg. Samples to collect, um, scraping of tissues, tissue sections, or potentially whole animals uh, for necropsy. Um, since these are all environmental organisms, it's really important to take care to prevent contamination as much as possible. Make sure to send the samples quickly, particularly for smaller animals, small fish and amphibians, they autolyze rapidly. And so it's gonna make it difficult for the pathologist to um, identify lesions uh, either grossly or on histology. Culture is absolutely possible for Vibrio, Aeromonas, and Plesiomonas, um, but you need to make sure to tell the lab about what species you're working with. Um, trying to grow these organisms at 35 to 37 degrees Celsius may not be appropriate, and so the lab probably needs to adjust the temperature they incubate your plates at um, to be commensurate with the lifestyle of the host species you're working with. Microscopy can be really useful. Um, we have fluorescent antibodies available for Aeromonas salmonicida. We can identify these organisms based on colony morphology, biochemical tests. Uh, PCR and sequencing is also really useful, um, particularly to identify kind of the unusual organisms that we find in fish and other ectotherms. And by unusual, I mean organisms which aren't common in the mammalian world and so are therefore just less studied. From a zoonotic perspective, foodborne illness is really potentially quite important for all of these bugs. We can also see human infections following um, direct exposure to animals who may be colonized, so bites, pinch, or scratches. So getting pinched by a crab is a great way to get Vibrio vulnificus. And also just exposure to the environment. So walking into the ocean with cuts on your feet and legs or other parts of your body when considering treatment options, I would strongly recommend consulting a specialty reptile or amphibian or aquatic medicine textbook. The treatment of choice for Aeromonas hydrophila for frogs, um, you need to think about drugs with good gram-negative spectrum, so probably an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone. For Aeromonas salmonicida, it is possible to treat um, fish eggs in commercial operations, ideally based on antimicrobial uh, susceptibility testing. Um, but of course, you need to be aware of what drugs can legally be used in these contexts in your region. This is a link to some guidelines for antimicrobial use specific to aquaculture in Canada. Um, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in this area to check these out. With respect to intrinsic resistance, we do have some important uh, expected phenotypes that you should be aware of. Um, Plesiomonas is one of our Enterobacteriales, and actually our Aeromonas species have many of the same common uh, intrinsic resistance phenotypes. So our original recipe penicillin, glycopeptides, fusidic acid, most of our macrolides, lincosamides, streptogramins, rifampin, and oxyslidinones. All of our Aeromonas and Plesiomonas species are intrinsically resistant to amoxicillin and ampicillin as well as potentiated ampicillin, and variably other penicillins and cephamycins. A few new terms for today, and of course some questions for self-assessment. Mm -hmm.